All right. Well, thank you for the introduction. Um, things are great in the greenhouse right now, but it is cold outside. So let's talk about growing things indoors, um, which I've definitely spent a lot of time thinking about, and I'm happy to share what I know with all of you. As a place to start, I think it can help it's interesting. You know, there's a lot of different house plants, so many different species and cultivars. It can be hard to know how to do everything, but um, I'll try and give you some tips, things that do generally apply. And most of our house plants, the ones that are the easiest care, the most successful, these come from the tropics and from the subtropics, from places where they stay green all year round. That's what makes them great houseplants. They don't have the typical dormant season that we see in our plants outside right now. But that means that they're going to grow best with warm temperatures, hopefully about the temperatures that we keep our homes. And they are already adapted to the low light conditions that we have indoors. This is why they make good houseplants. They do, however, prefer relatively humid air. In the tropics, if you're thinking about tropical rainforests, it's going to be 50 to 70 percent relative humidity. And in our homes indoors in Wisconsin, things are very different, um, especially when it comes to humidity. So in our winter, we do have slightly cooler air temperatures. Plants can deal with that. They get significantly less light, though, which is um, not a great thing, but they can still get by. But what tends to harm most plants in winter and make them struggle is that lower humidity that we get. When we turn on the heaters, the relative humidity goes down, sometimes as low as you know 20 to 25 percent. We feel that our skin gets dry. And for plants, that's what causes them to really struggle in the winter. So the best thing you can do for your plants is to recognize how things are different for them. And even though these are evergreen plants, keeping their leaves all year round, they do still like a rest. They're not going dormant and dropping their leaves like the deciduous trees and plants that we see outside in Wisconsin for the most part, but they do still slow down. Because the temperatures are cooler, because there's so much more light, the plants are like, I'm going to back off and take a break. So give them that rest that they need. The plants may slow their growth or in some cases even really stop entirely. Recognize that and less water is going to be essential if you water them as much as you do in the spring and the summer, the roots are going to stay too wet. I don't fertilize my houseplants during the winter. They don't need it. They're not actively growing the way that they are in the spring and in the summer. They're taking a break. You can take a break for some, from some of those care tasks as well. Definitely wait to repot them until they start to grow again. When you start to see maybe a new leaf unfurl in the um, late winter, early spring, March, when the light starts to get brighter, the days are longer, that's the time to wait to repot them. Stressing them out by transplanting um, during their resting period is gonna be hard on the plants. One thing that you can increase and do more of is give them humidity because the humidity in our homes in the winter drops so drastically, it really stresses them out. That warm, dry air pulls the water out of their evergreen leaves. And because the roots are taking a break, they're not going to be pulling as much water out of the media and giving that to the plants. I've got a picture here from outside my greenhouse. And this is an outdoor evergreen plant, but it illustrates my point. Warm air from the greenhouse is being exhausted by that fan. So the leaves there where you see them browning, those leaves should have been dormant. They should have been cold and not losing moisture to the air, but because the warmth from the greenhouse woke them up, the dry air pulled the water out of the leaves and the roots were dormant. 
So no additional water was getting to the leaves from the roots and you end up with that tip burn that you see there. So let your roots recognize that they are resting. You're not gonna be able to give the plants the water that they need through the roots. Keep the air moist. A Couple of ways that you can do that. You can protect your plants from water loss in a few ways. Put them in a protective container. This is a cloche. It's not a full terrarium. It still has some airflow. You can see there's a gap between the um, ceramic and the glass. So it does still get airflow. It's not entirely closed, but it creates a nice little humid microclimate for this peace lily that I have there. Um, the peace lily is actually getting some um, spa treatment. It was brought to me by a friend and was kept unprotected on a very, very cold winter day. So I'm giving this one a little extra love while I help it recuperate. You can also increase the humidity right around the plants and create a microclimate by grouping your plants together. As they transpire, they lose water from their leaves, but they can kind of share that and create a microclimate um, around themselves. So grouping plants in your home can be a good way to beat the winter um, loss of humidity. Again, here's a picture from my greenhouse to illustrate this. We're growing tomatoes in the greenhouse on the right, and you can see all of the moisture condensing on the outside wall. The greenhouse on the left doesn't have those plants in it. In fact, it was empty when I took this picture. No moisture in the air, no condensation on the walls. So the plants themselves are pumping moisture into the air. And if you put them together, they'll help each other out a little bit. Another way to add humidity, a pebble tray um, can be kind of attractive. You just need a shallow tray, maybe about two inches deep, fill it with about an inch of small stones. It should be solid on the bottom. You don't want drainage on your pebble tray. You can see that I've just used a, a plant dish. This is what I use to catch the water when I am irrigating my plants. But in this case, I've lifted the plant pot up with a couple of inches of pebbles. Place that under the pot and keep water in it just about an inch to the level of the pebbles, but not to cover the level of the pot. You don't want your media to stay wet. You just want to create a humid environment and as the water evaporates off those pebbles, it will create that humid microclimate that the plant will enjoy. Um, one thing to point out, if you have hard tap water, like I do here in Madison, Wisconsin, you probably want to use distilled water or filtered water in some way. Um, if you do this a lot, as it evaporates, the salts and calcium will be left behind. You can see I have hard water, it's there. Um, the residue is all over my pot. Um, now in a pebble tray, this won't actually hurt the plants, but it can become unsightly. You'll just get that um, calcium deposit left behind if you use hard water. Misting is another way to keep your plants moist and help improve that humidity. Use tepid water, not cold, that can chill the plants. So use water that's at room temperature and Mist your plants, gently coating the leaves with fine droplets of water early in the day. You don't want to leave the, wets, leave the leaves wet overnight. That can encourage diseases to spread. A plain old humidifier works too, just to increase the humidity in a room or in an area where your plants are growing. But again, avoid using hot water or, or hard water, or you'll get the spotting on the leaves. Uh, and if you're using a humidifier, then you'd get the residues on that. Keep the humidity high. That's really the best way to combat um, the struggles that our plants see in the winter. But there are other things you can do this time of year too. You can enjoy your plants. We're stuck in our houses, so take advantage of their beauty and maybe give them a little extra attention. It's a good time to pay attention to them. Dust and polish the leaves while you're misting. And 
give them some close inspection to tech, look for pests and diseases. What kind of pests and diseases are you likely to see? There are a few things that because we're closer to our plants, we're more likely to notice. And because of winter conditions, there are certain pests that take advantage of that and show up in greater numbers. Probably the most common one is going to be our happy friend, the spider mite. Spider mites, like many of our insect and mite pests, are tiny. They're hard to see, so it's important to learn to recognize the symptoms. What will the plant look like if it has spider mites, even if you can't see the mites themselves? So the picture on the left here is the webbing that gives spider mites their name. They're not actually spiders, but they do create a spider-like web. The picture on the right is an example of stippling. That's the feeding that happens when spider mites are on your plant. They look like little tiny pinpricks, or it's like somebody put sandpaper on the leaves. And this has to do with how spider mites feed on our plants. They have a little sharp needle-like mouth point part that they stick into the cells and they suck out the tissue. So everywhere that they have fed, they've sucked out the green and the chlorophyll and you're left with a little pinprick. But the mite pest itself is very, very tiny. This is a microscope fo photo. And uh, here I've got some video from underneath a microscope multiplied about 30 times to be able to show you what they look like. The little round dots are their eggs, which are even smaller, but the mites themselves are pinhead sides. You might be able to see them, um, but having a microscope definitely helps. Why do mites show up in the winter? Well, they love the low humidity. Moist environments tend to inhibit their growth. I'm not sure exactly why, maybe there's a fungal pathogen that attacks their eggs and it's more prevalent in high humidity conditions, but in low humidity, that's when we see spider mite outbreaks. That's why, you know, almost as soon as you turn on the central heating in the late fall and the winter, oh, I didn't know there was a problem with this plant, but all of a sudden you've got spider mites. Well, they were probably there before, but they were just inhibited by more humid air conditions. So one of the things you can do for spider mites is keep the humidity high, and that will help your plants as well. If you do have an extreme uh, outbreak, you can address that using um, chemical or some um, other physical pest controls. One thing that you can do is mist your plant, as I said, that helps to um, wash the mites off if you have a high infestation. If you're able to, put your plant in the shower, draw the sh shower curtain and wash it off. Again, that will raise the humidity and it will also wash off the mites for the most part. For um, chemical pest controls, insecticidal soap works very well against spider mites, but you may need to do a few applications. It kills the adults, but the eggs will still there, be there and they can hatch once something like an insecticidal soap uh, has lost its effectiveness. This time of year, you might also notice you've got fungus gnats. Again, these show up when we're paying closer attention to our plants. If you see a little um, flying pest, black insect hovering around your plants, it's probably not a fruit fly. Fruit flies are fat, round bodies and have short legs and short wings and antenna. Fungus gnats are more leggy and long. They have long antennae and long stretched out legs. And they will hover around your plants because they lay their eggs in wet soil. And if you have wet soil in the winter, fungus gnats are going to breed in that. The adults will fly and hover around the plants looking for a mate or a place to lay their eggs. One way to prevent fungus gnats is to keep your soil dry. And less watering in the winter is what we recommend anyway. You may see something that looks like a mold, but could actually be a mealybug. This is an insect pest. They don't look much like insects, do they? But these are the adult females. The males do look like tiny um, gnats or midges, but you'll rarely see them. The adult females though, um, this is a long-tailed mealybug. They have the long filamentous tails. 
And then they lay their eggs in these cottony masses that can look like mold if you aren't familiar with them. Mealybugs can also be dealt with chemically with insecticidal soaps or with some systemic pesticides like imidacloprid, which is available at many garden centers. You can also wash these off, but as with the other pests, they'll probably come back if you're not thorough. Um, you can also use a um, alcohol wipe. So if you wash them off and then spray with a little bit of dilute rubbing alcohol, that can kill any that maybe you missed when you were washing your plant. White flies sometimes come in if we have plants that we brought in from outside. Maybe you looked them over when you brought them in in the fall, um, didn't notice anything, but if you missed a few uh, white flies that were in the pupil or the larval stage, they can hatch into these adults. And we see those as little white flies hovering around our plants. They're a little more difficult to get rid of, um, depending on the plant. Say if this comes in on a poinsettia over the holiday, if it comes from a greenhouse that didn't do proper pest care, you may just want to get rid of that plant. Um, if you want to hold on to it, expect to do some chemical treatments. The systemic pesticides like imidacloprid are effective. Uh, if you want to use a chemical control like insecticidal soap, expect to do a couple of treatments. Um, and sometimes those are hard to do in the winter. You can't just take the plant outside and spray it. Final pest I have to show you, mostly just because it's a cool video. Um, aphids don't tend to be a problem in the winter. They like warmer temperatures, but they do occasionally show up. Uh, we call them plant lice for a reason because they are you know, thickly coating the leaves and the stems. And these are pretty easy to take care of. They wash off easily and they are um, very susceptible to things like insecticidal soaps or to the systemic pesticides or to an alcohol um, dilute treatment as well. So I wanted to leave plenty of time for questions. I know we've had a lot of interest. So tell me, what um, do you want to know about taking care of your winter house plants? Thank you, Johanna. There are lots of questions um, in our q and I'll try to get to as many as possible. Uh, I do want to point out that we dropped a link to an evaluation survey into the chat. So feel free to uh, go to that link after the webinar and give us your feedback. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, so just check the chat for that link to that evaluation survey. Um, I'm going to start with some watering questions. There's a little bit about watering and humidity uh, here. So one was about using distilled water. They had heard that distilled water distilled water isn't good for plants because it doesn't have nutrients in it. Is this true? Well, we don't expect our water to be the nutrient source. Uh, in my case, I prefer distilled water for my plants because the nutrients that are there, um, there's too much calcium. And because I live in a city and I've got a municipal water supply, they also add fluoride and chlorine, both of which plants don't like. So I would rather start with a more pure water source and add the nutrients that I want in the quantities that I want. So distilled water is really better for your irrigation source. Plan to use a complete fertilizer uh, when that's appropriate. So don't rely on your water source for plant nutrition. Great. But know what's in your water source so that you can avoid adding too much of something like calcium if you already have a lot of it. Perfect. Yeah. And in here in Wisconsin, a lot of our water has a lot of calcium in it. So it does. what about um, somebody has a reverse osmosis drinking water filtration system? So that sounds like that's filtering the water. That sounds like it would be okay then. Yep. That will take irrigating. out most of those salts like calcium, sodium, if you have a um, water softener and that will get rid of the chlorine and the fluoride. So that will uh, clean up the water and get rid of those salts. Great. Now, what are some signs of low humi humidity? Um, it, would it maybe leaf curling or yellowing leaves? You know, what are some symptoms that we can kind of say, oh, well, let's try adding some humidity to? Yeah, definitely. So you've hit on some of the key ones. Leaf curling, the leaf curling up and in, it's trying to protect itself. It's trying to create that little microclimate and keep the, uh, the dry air from pulling away the uh, moisture from the leaves. So yes, cupping or curling in can be a symptom. And also uh, tip burn at the outer edge. 
uh, of the leaf can be a symptom as well. Okay. Um, let's see, we do have some people that have their indoor plants that are still blooming or flowering. So in those cases, should they continue fertilizing them through the winter here if they're, if they're actively blooming like that? Good. I'm glad somebody asked that one. So if you have a potted flowering plant like a poinsettia or a chrysanthemum that you bought for the season, yes, that one's still going to be actively growing and should be kept with regular water and maybe a little bit of fertilizer. It depends on how long you're planning to keep it. So this, the talk that I gave is generally for your foliage house plants, your, you know, philodendrons, your peace lilies, um, the aglaonemas or Chinese evergreens. If you have a potted flowering plant, you're going to want to treat that as if it was actively growing. And there are a few things, um, if you have something that's a winter bloomer, like an African violet or a um, an orchid, uh, Phalaenopsis or a um, corsage orchid as well. Those you'll want to keep watering regularly, but absolutely humidity is going to help all of those species, especially in the winter. So watering you'll want to keep up on something that is actively growing. Mm -hmm. We have uh, some guests here that are having some problems with fungus gnats. So could you just review, you know, they've tried, it seems like everything. Could you maybe give some suggestions on how to combat those fungus gnats? Yeah. So prevention, keeping your soil on the dry side. There are, um, this is one of the few places where I have a beneficial control to recommend. So Usually I don't recommend like releasing ladybugs into your house to deal with aphids. Um, you're gonna wanna leave those outside. But there is a biological organism that I use in the greenhouse for fungus gnat control that's available over the counter for uh, homeowners. And it's a beneficial nematode, a little roundworm called Steiner Nema feltiae. Um, and maybe somebody can write that into the chat or I can try in a little while. But you can order these online. I haven't seen them at a lot of garden centers, but you can always ask. But you can order them online. Uh, Nemesis is one of the brand names. And you'll, they'll send you a little sponge that is full of nematodes. You soak that sponge in your watering can and water your plants with that. And that will put the nematodes into the soil so they won't be in your house and around and you won't even see them without a high powered microscope but they will hunt through the soil and attack the fungus gnat larva there. Now they won't go away immediately because they won't attack the adults, but they will be in the soil attacking the larva and every successive generation of larva should get less and less. So that's a biological control that you can use for fungus gnat um, attacks. Uh, you know, treating them with topical insecticides because the fungus gnat larva are living in the soil a spray with a um, insecticidal soap or an oil really isn't going to cut it. So you need to uh, address it in the soil where they are. Okay. Great advice. I think Anne has been looking at the questions too. So I'm going to have Anne jump in and ask the next question. So uh, there's been a number of questions regarding lighting and uh, using some artificial lights, lightiness with plants. If you could just address some of those type of questions on what people can do if they want to use supplemental light or if it's needed during winter time. Uh, that'd be great, thanks. Sure. Our plants are going to rest. That's how they're going to cope with lower light. If you want to keep them actively growing, give them more light. So if you have plants that you don't wanna go into that rest period, then add some supplemental light. Or if you have, um, you know, new plants, if you're going to transplant or if you're going to start seeds, you'll probably need some supplemental light. Um, for, for homeowners, um, fluorescence, you know, many of us still have fluorescent glow, grow lights and there's no reason to toss those out if they're still working well. Um, more and more though, you do see the um, LED grow lights and it's up to you whether you want to go with the purple one that has red and blue LEDs or with a white one. The plants are pretty happy either way. Commercial growers who are extremely interested in high efficiency and best growing are going to invest in the red and blue grow lights. Um, but for a homeowner to get the higher intensity, the greater 
power of the light, you can get that from either a red, blue, or a white light. And um, the white lights are just more comfortable to work with. So um, I recently installed LED light fixtures here in the greenhouse. And because I get so many visitors, classes, the general public are welcome to come visit, I went with white LEDs. They're slightly less efficient, but I didn't need to give all of my visitors headaches and I work here. I didn't need, <laughs> need headaches all day long from the, the red, blue LEDs. So hopefully that's helpful. Yes, thank you. Uh, we had some questions about fertilizing. So when do you start fertilizing again? How do you know? And um, what kind of fertilizer do you use? Right, start fertilizing again when the light comes back. Maybe wait and let the plant show you that it's growing again by opening up a new leaf. When you see that, go ahead and start fertilizing. If you really do feel like your plants are nutrient stressed over the winter, it's okay to use a slow release fertilizer. So a few granules of an osmocote or something that at a low dose, um, those, plant, those won't overpower your plants. It is slow release for a reason. So if you do want to fertilize during the winter, it's just, you know, when it works best with your schedule, I would go with a slow release. Um, for other times of year, a water-soluble fertilizer that you mix up and add into your um, irrigation water can be an easy alternative. And for those, you really do want a, a low rate. And for things like um, orchids, an even lower rate. So follow the instructions on whatever product you have. You'll want something that is either pretty even or um, lower in phosphorus. So, so the three-digit code on a fertilizer represents nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. N, P, and K are the chemical symbols. And you want to avoid something that's super high in nitrogen. So don't use your lawn fertilizer. Your lawn fertilizer has lots of nitrogen because you want lots of green leafy growth. But if you have a house plant that you want to flower or that you want to encourage to um, get larger, you're going to want something that has a more moderate amount of nitrogen. And something that's, those three numbers are all the same, like a 14, 14, 14, or a 12, 13, 10. Those are probably decent numbers to look for. Okay, great. Well, uh, I'm sorry that we didn't get to more questions. I know there was a bunch in there, but I encourage people to reach out to your local extension office. Um, we can certainly get you pointed in the right direction and we can ask Johanna for answers to your questions um, if you reach out to us. So contact your local extension office. We have lots of information about houseplants and white flies and fungus gnats and all those pests on the horticulture website as well. Uh, a little reminder just to fill out that survey for us and give us your feedback. Thank you, Johanna, for being here.